So this weekend, we are delighted to welcome to Pitt Street Professor Jo Bessler. In the past years, we have enjoyed hearing about the work of progressive biblical scholars. Jo's field is constructive theology, and over the weekend, his work will lead us in further interesting directions. Jo is the Robert Travis Peake Professor of Theology at Phillips Theological Seminary in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Phillips is affiliated with the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Jo is co-author of a book, Law and Theology, Cases and Readings, and author of A Scandalous Jesus. And I mentioned before, he has a chapter in the book, The Historical Jesus Goes to Church, a chapter on prayer. Jo enjoys cross-disciplinary conversations that open up theological questions in new ways. He is completing a new book titled Moving Words, How Theology Proposes to Lead Beyond God, in which he looks at the ways that political and theological discourses overlap. Jo has worked closely with the West Star Institute, both in the latter years of the Jesus Seminar and in the beginnings of the God Seminar. And in addition to his theology courses at Phillips, he offers a variety of classes in the interaction of religion and culture. We are delighted to have Joe and his partner Laura join us for Common Dreams at Pitt Street. Please join me in welcoming Joe Bessler as we engage in the challenge of doing theology in the age of Trump. <laughs> Thank you, Margaret. <clears throat> um, thank you, Rachel, for your singing. Uh, beautiful, beautiful hymns. Laura and I are <clears throat> delighted to be here with you. Um, this is, it's hard for us to believe that this is our last stop in Australia. Uh, having begun in, in Brisbane and gone to Perth and Melbourne and, um, and here, and those were just the larger cities. Why? Um, but it has been a joy as people have welcomed us and uh, really kind of cared for us uh, every step of the, along the way. We've had marvelous conversations and are deeply grateful for the experience. It's been incredibly rich. Uh, tonight, the, the title, the Theology in the Age of Trump, is actually going to be a title of a forthcoming book uh, from Wipfenstock that the God Seminar, which is and uh, one of the, the follow-alongs after the Jesus Seminar um, has done, and it's about 14 or so different essays, short essays from different fellows. And um, so that should be forthcoming. Uh, tonight, what I'm, what I'm doing, I'm going to get into the weeds a little bit. There are still a lot of people who think that, that Donald Trump is an anom anomaly uh, politically. Um, and I want to really kind of dig into this and demonstrate the ways in which uh, he's not. Um, and the way in which, so even on pages two and three or so of my text, I'm developing a literary um, uh, analog uh, through the novel Beloved uh, to talk about um, Trump as a ghost, as a specter, uh, as a haunting of the, uh, of the past 60 years. Um, but here it goes. Here we are. Oh, and I'll be working on this. I hope I keep mindful of that. <laughs> right, right, okay, good. The West Star Institute, um, which is the, the, the housing body of the Jesus Seminar, the God Seminar, Paul Seminar, etc., was organized itself against a backdrop of resurgent politicized fundamentalism of the late 1970s and 1980s. In their introduction to the five Gospels, Bob Funk and Roy Hoover called on scholars to engage in a process of, vis of public visibility. I love this paragraph. <clears throat> Academic folk are a retiring lot. We prefer books to lectures and solitude to public display. Nevertheless, we have too long buried our considered views of Jesus and the Gospels in technical jargon and in obscure journals. 
We have hesitated to contact or to contradict, I'm sorry, TV evangelists and pulp religious authors for fear of political reprisal and public controversy. Who's he thinking of there? He's thinking of Jerry Falwell in the late 1970s, right on the heels as Ronald, as Ronald Reagan kind of appropriates that voice into the Republican Party. And we have been intimidated by promotion and tenure committees to whom the charge of popularizing or sensationalizing biblical issues is anathema. It is time for us to quit the library and to speak up. Now in their play of buried voices in that third line and speaking up, one hears the language of resurrection in a new, more urgent political key. What Funk and Hoover said then needs to be said again now. There is a direct correlation between that time and now. And I want us to better understand that connection, that haunting of the past into this time. Because the election of Donald Trump as President of the United States needs to be met with the same call for academic quote folk to quit the library and to speak up, but also for lay folk to also get public and to speak up. One can hear the urgency in other voices, including these from the Republican Party itself. <clears throat> this from John McCain, who I'm not sure how long he has for this world. He has uh, brain cancer and uh, um, I've been amazed at the, the length of time he's actually hung on uh, so far. It's time to wake up. We have to fight against propaganda and crackpot conspiracy series, theories. We have to fight against isolationism, protectionism, and nativism. We have to defeat those who would worsen our divisions. We have to remind our sons and daughters that we became the most powerful nation on earth by tearing down walls, not, not building them. He's clearly speaking of Trump, although he doesn't name him explicitly. This also then from Jeff Flake, and these dates here are roughly, they're going to hover around a, a, a similar time frame. It must also be said that I rise today with no small measure of regret. Regret because of the state of our disunion. Regret because of the disrepair and destructiveness of our politics. Regret because of the indecency of our discourse. Regret because of the coarseness of our leadership. Regret for all of our complicity in this alarming and dangerous state of affairs. It is time for our complicity and our accommodation of the unacceptable to end. If you want to catch an even stronger, uh, stronger language from Senator Flake, uh, Google his, um, his speech to the uh, uh, convocation speech to a Harvard Law School. Uh, in, in June. However, I do wish that Senator Flake would have voted against uh, the, the uh, promoted legislation of President Clinton, or I'm sorry, President uh, uh, Trump more. Uh, in too many cases, uh, he did not. John, John McCain clearly did resist uh, Trump on the repeal of the Health Care Act. This from Republican Senator Bob Corker. I don't know why the president tweets out things that are not true. You know it. Everyone knows it, but he does. He does. These three senators who at that time had the courage to speak out all had something else in common. They would not be running for re-election. Right? Um, freedom could be uh, just another word for nothing left to lose in that <laughs> that, uh. So I found myself listening to the above remarks from these senior Republican senators in October of 2017 while leading several class sessions on Nobel Prize winning uh, author Toni Morrison's novel Beloved which, which deals with the theme of haunting and possession. As I took in these comments, my mind went to the young teenage figure named Denver, who late in the novel realizes that the haunting figure of Beloved is draining the life from her mother, Setha, as well as endangering her own well-being. Somebody, Denver realizes, had to be saved, end quote. And her conviction that Beloved is haunting, possessing her mother, forces on Denver another truth, namely a sociologist Avery Gordon says, quote, the necessity of doing something about it. 
in order to get help for her mother to get herself a job. Denver knows she will need to go outside a gate and cross a threshold she had not traversed for a long time for fear of the racist violence and rejection she would experience beyond it. She will have to leave the space of her yard. She, quote, stood on the porch in the sun and couldn't leave it, end quote. She stood frozen in place until she heard the voice of her dead grandmother, marvelous character in the novel, Baby Suggs. Quote, Denver's throat itched, her heart kicked, and then Baby Suggs laughed, clear as anything. You mean I never told you nothing about slavery in Carolina? About your daddy? You don't remember nothing about how I come to walk the way I do, about your mother's feet, not to speak of the scars on her back. I never told you all that. Is that why you can't walk down these steps and out that gate? My Jesus, my. And Denver responds, but you said there was no defense against white people. Baby Sugg says there ain't. Then what do I do, pleads Denver know it and go on out the yard go on while I feel the strangeness of setting the character of Denver and the story of beloved alongside the words of powerful white Republican male US senators I do so because I see both sets of characters attempting to find courageous footing in a haunted world and so Denver's awakening to her own responsibility in confronting what is haunting her mother and her family is itself a transformative moment in that novel. We still are praying for a transformative moment in our politics. Writing about the phenomenon of being haunted, Avery Gordon in her work, Ghostly Matters, Haunting in the Sociological Imagination, says that such experience, quote, draws us effectively and sometimes against our will and always a bit magically into the structure of a reality we come to experience not as cold knowledge but as transformative recognition. The discomfort McCain, Flake, and Corker feel is palpable as they struggle to come to grips with the social forces that a president of their own party has courted and let loose in the country. Like Denver, I think they see and feel at a visceral level what is at stake in allowing these social forces to metastasize into a discourse of narcissistic fascism. There's the white supremacist violence in Charlottesville, Virginia, the Alabama senatorial campaign of racist Roy Moore, distrust of our key allies in favor of thugs like Putin, most recently, of course, in the disaster of Helsinki the gutting of the climate accords and other treaties, the constant daily attempts of a Trump White House to undermine the integrity of the press, the findings of science, the leadership of women in public life. No wonder New Jersey uh, former governor, Christine Todd Whitman, I believe in the, das in the last uh, day or so, has called for Trump's resignation and has called for other Republicans to have the courage to speak and to call for Trump's resignation. Beyond the necessity of leaving the yard, Denver also knew she would have to tell the story of her mother, of beloved, of their lives at 124 Bluestone Road. Quote, nobody was going to help her unless she told it, told all of it, end quote. It is that act of taking responsibility and confession, as it were, that begins to weaken the hold and the power of possession. To be sure, it is not clear whether these three senators or others moved by them will have the courage to tell all of it. So far, it is far from it. So far from naming the party's deep complicity over the past 60 years and stoking a culture of white resentment that longs for a lost order of racial and male hegemony. But I am going to tell some of that story this evening because we in the States are living with ghosts that threaten the fabric of the Republic itself. And that same ghost or one like it could come to haunt your politics as well. Whether in Bob Funk's language of speaking up or McCain's language of waking up, 
Political and theological voices need to move beyond, in Gordon's words, quote, a dull curiosity or a detached know-it-all criticism into the passion of what is at stake. Let's begin by having a look at a Tom Tola's political cartoon that I used in an essay for the Oklahoma Observer about six to eight months before the GOP convention that nominated Trump. My essay clearly did not turn many votes around, but I'll we'll say, in Oklahoma. Right. Here are these elephants, the symbols of the Republican Party, and they're having a conversation. We've got a Trump problem. He's appealing to voters who are responding to racism bordering on fascism. It's a real dilemma. How do we get rid of Trump but keep those voters? As the cartoon brilliantly illustrates, what Republicans have yet to own but cannot do so publicly is that Donald Trump is not the real problem. The real problem is the audience they have created and catered to during the last 60 years. Well, and this is quite fascinating. The establishment candidates in the 2016 election, and think of them, Jeb Bush with uh, his spouse, who's a Latina, uh, John Kasich, kind of a middle of the road, white guy, um, uh, governor of Ohio, a uh, key state. Uh, ben Carson, a black candidate, Ted Cruz, a Hispanic candidate, Marco Rubio, a uh, Latino uh, candidate. So the Republican, these are the establishment kind of candidates that are running, realizing the need to change their discourse in order to reach out to women, to reach out to blacks, to reach out to Hispanics and Latinos that had sought to back away from the religious and the political ideology of the past 60 years. And Donald Trump walks into that group, into the midst of that group, and basically says, in effect, if you don't want that old audience, I do. And he proceeded to run the tables. Despite the fact that some want to say that Trump is a complete anomaly, in truth, Trump is not other. He is not a complete outlier to the Republican brand, as many Republicans have tried to claim. He's the backward-looking, making America great again, white male savior Republicans have been promising to their religious and cultural base for about 60 years. Trump played to old deals and old resentments so successfully, and he did so against the grain of the Republican Party establishment with an increasingly vulgar attack on his fellow candidates. Trump was not following any political commandments, including even Ronald Reagan's 11th commandment not to speak ill of a fellow Republican. Trump's strategy in the primaries, in effect, depended on him violating that commandment, upsetting the manners and expectations of the party establishment in order to convince those largely, largely white male, Tea Party, Christian conservatives, that he was genuinely on their side. It was a gamble, and it paid off. Almost 10 months into his presidency, Chris Matthews on his MSNBC program Hardball called the transformation of Republicans into the image of Trump an invasion of the body snatchers. It's more on the possession theme, I think, again. Members of the Republican Party, he said, are, quote, becoming Trumpites, no longer the actual people we thought we knew, end quote. And now, only six months later, it now appears that Trump is solidly in control of the Republican Party, with few in his party willing to challenge him. And then question and answer, if you like, I mean, we can talk a little bit more about, about why that is. But just recently, former Republican Speaker of the House, John Boehner, speaking to a conference in Michigan, told the gathering, quote, there is no Republican Party, there's a Trump Party. The Republican Party is taking a nap somewhere. End quote. Talk about needing to leave the yard. Where's the political courage? And again, I'm thinking of Christine Todd Whitman speaking up, calling forth some Republican courage, perhaps because she also might want to run for president. But if Trump violated Reagan's 11th commandment in order to make his play, in other ways he dug into Reagan's playbook of cultural resentment more deeply than anyone had anticipated. 
To get a sense of that playbook, I'd like us to look at the final lines of Ronald Reagan's 1980 acceptance speech at the Republican National Convention. It was a speech that had been saturated with the language of family values, freedom, the utterly exceptional character of the nation. But now at the end of the speech, Reagan seems to move towards prayer. He seems hesitant at first, but then resolves to speak. Reagan first announces that he is going off script. Why tell us that? Oh, now I'm going off my script here. Perhaps in order to convince us how authentic he is. But here he says, I've thought of saying something that's not part of my speech and I'm, I'm worried over whether I should do it. Do you think he took some acting lessons? I don't know. I think. <laughs> Can we doubt that only a divine providence placed this land, this island of freedom here as a refuge for all those people in the world who yearn to breathe freely? And then his final two lines, resolving the question he was worrying about over. Oops. I'll confess, here he is, I'll confess that I've been a little afraid to suggest what I'm going to suggest. I'm more afraid not to. That we begin our crusade, joined together in a moment of silent prayer. God bless America. With those final lines, Reagan reached back 20 years and tapped into the resentment of religious conservatives of both political parties. And that's key. His invocation of a silent prayer plays directly, and this may seem hard to imagine just reading the text, but we're going to kind of look at this a bit, plays directly to the 1964 Supreme Court rulings against teacher-led school-sponsored prayer in public schools and school-sponsored Bible readings in public schools. In 1964, that was also an election year, the sense of passionate betrayal on the part of conservative Christians was expressed in the phrase, that godless court. And with his language of crusade, Reagan aligned himself with a religious fervor, a religious battle to take back the holy land of America, to reconsecrate it to that religious compact undertaken so long ago. He was going to bring some sense of sacrality and strength back to American governance, and he was reaching out to new partners to do it. By the time of his acceptance speech, Reagan had already begun to build common cause with the newly elected in 1979 Roman Catholic Pontiff John Paul II around another Supreme Court decision. This will be a leitmotif, Supreme Court decisions. Roe v. Wade, 1973, which was the decision that gave women certainly during the first trimester, to some extent under, with medical circumstances under the second trimester, access to abortion using that decision to draw Protestant fundamentalists into common cause with conservative Roman Catholics. Reagan drew on the values and resentments of religious conservatives that cut across party lines as a key part of his electoral strategy in 1980. He had been explicit about this strategy in a 1977 speech at the fourth annual CPAC convention, Conservative Political Action Council, entitled The New Republican Party. Reagan claimed that the long-standing split between social conservatives and fiscal conservatives was no longer necessary. Bridging this divide between conservatives, he argued, could forge a new conservative majority in the nation. So let's look at a couple of those slides together. Notice how he thinks about these. The so-called social issues, law and order, abortion, Busing, that was to end, help end segregation, moving children from one school district to another where there would be a better ma racial mix. Ethnic and religious groups themselves traditionally associated with the Democratic Party. The economic issues, on the other hand, inflation, deficit spending, big government, they're usually associated with the Republican Party and members of, of uh, independence. But 
he continues, the old lines that once clearly divided these two kinds of conservatism are disappearing. In short, isn't it possible to combine the two major segments of contemporary American conservatism into one politically effective whole? And here's the former governor of California who had signed into legislation the largest abortion, uh, uh, the largest uh, access to abortion bill in the country as governor of California, now completely walking that back into a very different kind of stance. Hmm. We'll have to think more about that. Reagan intended to split the Democratic Party along the lines of race, religion, family values. In 1979, Jerry Falwell, notice the time frame here, in 79, Jerry Falwell launched his moral majority movement aligning its message quite closely to that of candidate Reagan. This from his 1980 speech, Listen, America. That's, that's a real church sermon, is it? Listen, America. He's speaking broadly here. We must reverse the trend America finds herself in today. Young people have learned to disrespect the family as God has established it. I wonder what that means. Hmm. I think we probably know. They have been educated in the public school system that is permeated with secular humanism. What's he talking about there? No more prayer in public schools, right? They have been taught that the Bible is just another book of literature. Why is he saying that? Because the Supreme Court did in fact say, if you teach, if you teach the Bible as literature, that's fine. But not if you teach it out of religious conviction. They have been taught that there are no absolutes in our world today. Hang on to that language of moral absolutes. It's key to that, to that ideology. These same young people have been reared under the influence of a government that has taught them socialism and welfareism. There's that complaint. They have been taught to believe that the world owes them a living whether they work or not. It is now time to take a stand on certain moral issues and we can only stand if we have leaders. We must stand against the Equal Rights Amendment which was still working its way through the states, the feminist revolution, and the homosexual revolution. We must have a revival in this country. And in 1981, the recently elected Roman Catholic pontiff, John Paul II, issued his first apostolic exhortation on the family, familiaris consortio, or the role of the Christian family in the modern world, in which the pontiff claims that, quote, the church perceives in a more urgent and compelling way her mission of proclaiming to all people the plan of God for marriage and the family, end quote which would restate, of course, Catholic opposition to all forms of birth control, to all abortions, to homosexual weddings, marriages. It is worth dwelling on the formation of this political vortex a bit more. So here I'm trying to excavate this, and I'm just going to do a couple more moves to get us there. Going back just a bit, in a 1967 essay entitled, Is There a Third Force in Christendom? Question mark. Sociologist William McLaughlin had noted a positional symmetry between an emergent group. Now think of this in 67. This is an emergent group that he called the New Evangelicals. And the politics of the Republican nominee for president in 1964, who was Barry Goldwater, who was quite the, um, again, um, free market uh, he got, he got clobbered by Lyndon Johnson, but he, many people who remained in the Republican Party loved Barry Goldwater. Here's this. Um, the new evangelicals, this is McLaughlin, are lock, stock, and barrel with Senator Barry Goldwater. For them, applied Christianity is still basically soul winning. They equate Christianity with the American way of life for reasons we'll see in a minute. They are hysterically anti-communist in foreign policy and totally opposed to any extension of the welfare state in domestic policy. For the evangelicals, as for Billy Graham, the greatest problems facing America today are the Supreme Court's rulings on Bible reading and school prayer in public schools, spiraling divorce rate, etc. And now just a bit further, and this I'll kind of bottom out this analysis here. Whence their sense of outrage over the court's 1964 decisions? Whence the sense of betrayal? 
The roots of this outrage reach back at least to the development of the Cold War of the late 1940s and 1950s. A war saturated, as it turns out, in religious language. I mean, there's one theology or another just saturating this political landscape that we're discussing. In his 1949 inaugural address, Democrat Harry Truman framed this new conflict with the Soviet Union in explicitly religious terms, noting that the global, quote, uncertainty, end quote, that had fallen upon two world wars in the century already. Truman said, quote, it is fitting that we take this occasion, right, uh, his inaugural address, to proclaim to the world the essential principles of the faith by which we live and declare our aims to all peoples. We believe, this is right from his speech, that all men are created equal because they are created in the image of God. From this faith, we will not be moved. Um, can you see what he's doing here? He's interpreting the line, all men are created equal, which comes from the Declaration of Independence. And he's interpreting that through the lens of Genesis, of a biblical text. Right? Hmm. He then begins to draw the contrast. The United States and other like-minded nations find themselves directly opposed by a regime with contrary aims and oh, a totally different concept of life. That regime adheres to a false philosophy which purports, purports to offer freedom, security, and greater opportunity to mankind. That false philosophy is communism. It was the religious framing of the Cold War with phrases like, in God we trust, in 1956, being added to all U.S. currency, and the quote, under God, being added to the Pledge of Allegiance, 1954, that constructed the image of a Christian America. The close linkage between religion and politics and the rhetoric of the Cold War helped reinvigorate the more conservative religious voices in the country. And then... When the Supreme Court decided what it did about school prayer, there was this sense of outrage, this sense of being turned upon. That helped fuel their move into political sphere, into political life in the Goldwater campaign. And that's what McLaughlin was picking up when he was doing his research essay in 67. Some, there's some new voters coming back in here, explicitly with some religious convictions and conservative ones. But those school prayer decisions were not the only Supreme Court rulings on their mind in 1964, just to keep this light motif going. Many religious conservatives, especially in the American South, were still feeling betrayed by another Supreme Court decision, one in 1954, Brown v. Board of Education, which dealt, of course, with the racial integration of public schools, effectively calling for racial integration across U.S. life. That decision would be on their mind in that 1964 election between Lyndon Johnson, who had been successful in passing the Civil Rights Act into law, the major political milestone undergirding the Brown v. Board of Education decision. Recall that the segregationist South in the U.S. had been solidly democratic, not Republican, solidly democratic. And here's a democratic president, Lyndon Johnson, basically, in their view, betraying them by encouraging Martin Luther King and by pursuing civil rights legislation. And so, yes, uh, Supposedly, this, this has been questioned on historical grounds, but, but allegedly Johnson had told uh, journalist Bill Moyers, I'm handing the South to the Republican Party for the next 20 years. Uh, he could have said 50, because that's what it has been. But by 1968 already, and Johnson did not run for re-election because of the Vietnam War, Republican candidate Richard Nixon would take full advantage of that resentment and the development of his Southern strategy. 
Now research, get into the weeds here just a bit, research by Randall Balmer has shown that the religious right as it emerged in the later 1970s did not actually or originally galvanize around the abortion decision but instead around the issue of race. In an IRS, that's the Internal Revenue Service, the tax body, in a ruling in 1970, it stripped the tax-exempt status from, quote, segregation academies, high schools, colleges, which had been set up, I believe high schools, on the basis of religious freedom, exclamation point. Australia's had some interesting religious freedom discussions going on like that. Those segregation academies, as they came to be called, were private Christian schools set up in response to Brown v. Board of Education, where the practice of barring black students continued, and they were using the claim of religious freedom to do it. The IRS, at least, said no. White evangelicals considered that ruling <clears throat> government overreach. Right? Then Republican strategists sensed a real opening, according to Balmer, when the IRS threatened in 1976, again, closing in on the Reagan time, to revoke the tax-exempt status of Bob Jones University because it did not allow interracial dating among its students, end quote. Evangelicals, again, furious. So at this point, Republican strategist Paul Weirich knew that a defense of racist segregation was too ugly an issue to lead with politically and he was instrumental in convincing evangelical leaders to lead with the abortion issue. Even though neither Falwell nor other evangelical leaders nor Southern Baptists had been upset with the abortion decision in 73 when it was announced. In fact, they were publicly in favor of it. So the reversal that's going on here in the late 70s, right, is, is in, in a sense completely uh, uh, governed by the uh, attempt uh, and the success of being politically involved and instrumental in uh, Reagan's victory. That agreement over leading with the abortion issue created common cause again with conservative Catholics. Reagan used all of that and ever since virtually every Republican candidate for president including the most recent one has claimed the Reagan agenda as their own. And by that agenda they mean weaving together the views of social religious conservatives and economic conservatives. Republican campaigns have winked at, tacitly encouraged, rhetorically played to white racial resentments that the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Law of 65 had sought to put to rest. Republicans have not sought over the past 60 years to bind up the wounds of the nation, as Lincoln had encouraged in his second inaugural. Instead, the party's electoral strategy has been to pour salt on those very wounds in order to convince white working class voters that liberal Democrats prefer blacks to them and therefore. Right. Do we have another slide of that? I'm not sure. As I mentioned in 2015-16, I don't think there's a slide. No. There had been signs that the Republican Party out of its need to be competitive nationally, seemed intent on moving away from its established pattern because they thought they needed to reach out to Latina, Latina voters, to women, to blacks, and into that more diverse mix of Republican candidates entered the rude, the crude, the belittling, the twittering figure of Donald Trump, whose ugly rhetoric signaled his disdain for those proposed shifts in Republican culture. Trump would be the happy warrior to speak up for all those largely white social religious conservatives who had been voting for the Republican Party since Reagan, but who had also felt that they had been shortchanged by the elite bankers. Trump spoke their language and was willing to criticize the establishment, making clear in his acceptance speech at the 2016 Republican Convention, I am your voice. He says, I have visited the laid off factory workers and the communities crushed by our horrible and unfair trade deals. These are the forgotten men and women of our country, people who work hard but no longer have a voice. I am your voice. And of course, it was much more targeted through ads, through other kinds of 
communiques. Trump's insistence, for example, that he would build a wall plays to a long-term conserv conservative and post-1968 Republican logic of drawing boundaries. The boundary between the races that segregation had sought to ensure, the boundary between states' rights and the federal government, the boundary between established by natural law between men's and women's roles in the family, the boundary between normal sexuality and perverted sexuality, as Falwell would put it, the boundaries between legal and illegal aliens. And all of those boundaries, all of those boundaries needing guns to protect them, if you want to know where the gun lobby really has its power, by no means it's not only in Republican circles, but it's largely there. Republicans invoke one boundary situation and then the others are understood, they're implied. Trump's making America great again was a strategic dog whistle telling his base that all he would, about everything he would undo beginning with the Obama legacy, race-based. That's how he would demonstrate his sincerity to that base. On election night, CNN commentator Van Jones called the election of Trump a, quote, white lash against a changing country, end quote. And not just against the Obama presidency. The unexpectedness of Trump's victory and what it revealed about America's political, racial, and religious divide matches Gordon's analysis. Quote, the ghostly haunt says something is happening you hadn't expect. It says something is making an appearance to you that had been kept from view. And exactly the election of Obama was, was taken by many people to say, oh, we're now beyond racism. Uh-uh. This election in 2016 demonstrated just how profound the racism in the United States continues to be. Following the presidential election in 2016, Toni Morrison joined 15 other writers in commenting on the election of Trump for The New Yorker. In her brief essay called Mourning for Whiteness, Morrison argues that Trump was elected because of his appeal to the fear in white people over the loss of their status in a post-civil rights world. Quote, so scary are the consequences of a collapse of white privilege that many Americans have flocked to a political reform that supports and translates violence against the defenseless as strength. These people are not so much angry as terrified with the kind of terror that makes knees tremble. And in fact, Trump did allude. There is this kind of study that's been out there for a while, a dozen years, 10 years or so, that in 2044, whites will no longer be the majority, the racial majority of the nation. And so this has kind of stoked the underbelly, especially in Republican politics. But, and, and Trump explicitly would allude to this in his speeches saying, you know folks, we don't have much time. This is probably the last election when we'll be able to claim this country as our own. All right. As in her novel, where the ghost beloved is itself rooted in sadness and profound mourning, Morrison here in her post-election essay locates the source of white rage and white's fear and terror of lost cultural power. She notes that, quote, so many white voters, both the poorly educated and the well-educated, embrace the shame and fear sowed by Donald Trump. Or, conversely, some, of course, did fear the so, did fear the, um, what Trump was sowing in terms of, oh, our hatred of Hillary Clinton. Right? So that, that's been an object, uh, so she's been a target for kind of a vilification for uh, about 25 uh, years as well. When one sees the staggering percentage of white male Christian evangelicals, from 80 to 83 percent, who voted for Donald Trump, one understands the dismay in Morrison's uh, voice. Uh, Roman Catholic men uh, voted for uh, Trump at about 64 percent. Uh, white male Protestant vote, mainline Protestant vote, for about 54%. Um, by framing my remarks in terms of Trump as a specter, as a haunting from the underbelly of Republican politics over the last 50 plus years, I mean to show that we will not be rid of Trump no matter how quickly he passes from the scene. That's the bad news. The party is now possessed by that spirit. 
informed by a religious fervor that burns with fear and resentment and increasing hostility. And that's why calls like Christine Todd Whitman's will probably go uh, ignored. Even as she and other major figures feel, if we don't say something, we look like fools because Trump is acting so incredibly narcissistically. What Trump has already gutted in the way of treaties, ecological and regulatory commitments will take real time and effort to undo. More seriously, Trump is undoing the ethical fabric of public speech in the nation. There being no regard, I mean none, for evidence, for truth. In his public speech, as he daily participates in the wholesale undermining of intellectual and moral credibility with respect to both national and foreign policy with respect to science, with respect to history, to journalism, to public ethics. When one thinks of the incredible pace of technological change, I mean just this, which is set to move us ex exponentially towards a post-human economy where smart machines can do more and more types, especially of more labor-intensive, manual labor-intensive jobs aiding humanity in many ways, but in ways that might also divide the upper two per three percent of income from the other 96 to 97 percent. About that we should be deeply concerned because we have seen how Trump so easily exploited the fears of the white working class in the U.S. as Morrison, among many others, have noted. We should all be deeply concerned that this style of irresponsibility in politics and in religious rhetoric, these two have been twinned over the last 60 years. That this will grow in the coming generation and not weaken. And not only in the United States, but across national borders when people look and see, how did Trump succeed in that? To what resentments did he play? I've tried to make some of them available to us tonight so that we can also think about in ways how might Trump's rhetoric cross national borders? How might it cross racial, gender, cultural lines? Certainly not my folks wish, but you may end up dealing with some of Trump's rhetoric even as we've dealt with the whole boatload. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, people, you have an opportunity now to, um, to respond to what Joe has laid before us and, um, to, and to ask questions. Um, and I'm just going to ask people to just be mindful of keeping a nice gender mix with, um, with the question ans asking and just to kind of keep your um, comments um, to, to, to brief um, questions rather than to um, long um, expositions. So um, we'll start... Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we were sort of thinking uh, two things. One was perhaps what an alternative theological discourse might be in this mm -hmm. context, but also we were wondering the global context where Trump's, the reaction to Trump globally is quite different to how people within the United States uh, are responding and whether or not it might be a bit like my lemon tree, which has got uh, root rot, and there's so much fruit on this tree, but I'm sure it's the last fruiting before the tree dies. Mm. Right, now the, the first part of your question, though, again, was went to, uh, what again? The, the first part, so, so take it with the root rot, but the first part of your question went to what? The context globally yes. is where it, it, the, the culture globally is very much ridiculing yes. the United States and Trump. Right. And, um, yes. No, no. Yeah. So, so there's a kind of ridiculing of, the, uh, of Trump. Sure. The, the context that you've described historically and yeah. culturally in the United States is fantastic. Yeah. But the context globally right. is very different. Sure. 
Well, I think the, the, the context globally is one of, in some sense, bewilderment. Uh, but again, there was George W. Bush, and George W. Bush was something, again, of a political cartoon in, 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 in real ways. Uh, Maureen Dowd, a New York um, columnist New York, for the uh, New York Times, says that the, the real point of, of each succeeding uh, Republican candidate is to make the last one look sane. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I think, again, the, the ways in which that the, the world is, is responding um, is, is actually being noticed by people who, who read serious journalism and, uh, in the States. Uh, and there is quite a bit of, of, of upheaval. Um, Nonetheless, what I think is really troubling, of course, as I was saying, is the fact that you're not getting Republicans speaking out themselves. And that's because, uh, let me just do a little bit more history here, in terms of the, when, when Republicans took control of the House in 2010, they gerrymandered the, the seats so that in most Republican districts, they would not have to worry about facing a challenge from a liberal candidate. They would only face a challenge from a more conservative type Tea Party candidate, right? So what's going on is that Trump, for all those Tea Party people, they love Trump. So what he's sitting on is a capacity to say to anybody who speaks up and challenges him publicly to say, hey, I'll put a primary on you. I'll get somebody to challenge you from the, the right and you're gonna really go down. And so everybody is, is just kind of keeping quiet. The, the, uh, the international outrage, however, is having a real effect. Um, it's, it's, hard to it's hard to quantify because the, the Trump White House just keeps lying about, uh, about how successful it is. And, and so, but, um, so there, there may still be some resonance to the idea of a judgment day having some kind of <laughs> moral value but uh, on this sense i do hope that the country wakes up this is a kind of a process of of awakening oh yes yes thank you the other well no but the other that's that's important because the other theological framework there's a number of very responsible people who are talking about the language of fascism for example in this president uh and rightfully so i think and so again the response the theological response to, to fascism uh has to be one resistance to it but also then a real willingness to speak out on behalf of others rights and to speak out on behalf of others who are the easy targets of a bully like Trump. Go, excuse me, going after immigration, going after one, one kind of, of a, a group after another. And so that's really where I think progressives, so progressives actually have to become uh, perhaps better uh, coalition builders. Uh, those of us who are in churches, I know, I love the, what your mission statement is, uh, regardless of belief or not belief, there is a, a, a real willingness to engage in, um, um, in coalitions for the sake of the common good that you have back there, not just for our own private religious identity, but for the common good. And Rachel was singing about this in her third song as well, in terms of what really, when push comes to shove, which we are at right now, push coming to shove, what really matters. So I do believe that that is, uh, is the theological place where we are. Uh, firstly, thank you very much for uh, your talk. Uh, you. Now, I'm, I'm a strong believer in um, fighting the good fight of the fight from 1, um, 1 Timothy 6, 11, 19. Um, and the word on the street is a lot of people out there are very aware of the falsivity um, of um, Trump's, um, yeah, Trump's um, politics, etc., um, and theology. Um, I guess I feel a little bit like you've left us on a cliffhanger though, and I'm kind of wondering what is your theological solution um, that we should do as progressives in the church? Right. Well, I think I just addressed that a little bit in terms of the theological response to Trump really has to, to be to mobilize all the voices that in fact we can, to try to build the bridges we can. On that sense, we no longer have, for example, in the Roman Catholic community, a John Paul II. 
uh, unfortunately, his hands might be pretty well tied by virtue of, of the, uh, all the people that John, uh, that John Paul II did put, it, put in. in the, uh, but um, nonetheless, there are, there are, are voices um, in more conservative communions. There are evangelical liberals. There are folks who are, are willing to be, uh, I think, part of speaking against what is clearly emerging as a dishonest president. Uh, as an immoral uh, president. And so what the progressive community I think really needs to be about is to mobilize those issues again on behalf of a common good. What fascinates me about the progressive movement is, and over the last, over this last still 60 years, is that you've got a, th a theological community uh, with very differing voices, but then in virtually every uh, significant way, have turned the, the goal of the religious life away from eternal life that is the salvation of one's own soul and more towards the transformation of this life, whether it's feminist theology, liberationist theology, womanist theology, whether it's uh, the return in contemporary kind of, of post-colonial theologies or of rhetorical theologies, there really is a, a, a concern here to, to again move towards uh, an ethical and just world as a theological vision in which, in which God, uh, for some, in which God is the, the key, or a, a key actor, not the only key actor, of course, but in the midst of life in a panentheistic way, um, or in the, um, in the way in which in, in some philosophical theologians where God is still kind of in the call of language and the call to, to justice. So uh, for others, the God language is still too damaged by its tradition to be of, of significant help here. We need to keep our focus on the transformation of structures here. So I think that, that those kinds of, of perspectives need to again define in this political event a common cause and uh, to speak against this, to speak in favor of the truth. To, faith, to speak in favor of the truth, whether it's in science, whether it's in journalism, whether it's in, with respect to uh, uh, political life, uh, whether it's respect to treaties, whether it's respect to climate change, we need public policy that, that adheres to evidence and that is honest and has integrity. And the religious voices should be organized around that. Um, I, I guess I should explain where I'm coming from a little bit. Um, I'm a nuclear disarmament activist and um, I'm acutely conscious of the danger of an anthropogenic um, apocalypse. Yeah. Um, it strikes me that some crucial parts of the critique of Trump um, are upside down, that he is criticized for things that he has done right and not criticized for the egregious wrongs which you've very much pointed to um, that he's helped to further. And I, you yourself unfortunately slipped into it when you referred to the disaster at Helsinki. Um, I put out a press release straight after Helsinki saying, if this be treason, let us have more of it, please. Um, a dialogue over nuclear weapons between Russia and the United States is an absolute survival imperative. Yeah. Trump is probably the person least qualified to do it, um, but without many Helsinkis, yeah. we will perish. Yeah. Well, I think uh, very well said. What I don't trust <clears throat> is that Donald Trump is, is a voice that will pursue that at all. And I think at this point, I mean, to, and, then, and then whether it's in the global press or whether it's just in, in our own take. I, all of these voices calling for confrontation with yeah. Putin calling for Putin to be called to account, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. in, in ways that, if they were ever implemented, would indeed take us into the abyss. 
Right. If they, if I, I'm not sure that that's uh, I mean, uh, envisioned. Like yes. And indeed, for some Democrats, yeah. That, that troubles me. And sure. indeed, even from parts of the nuclear disarmament yeah. movement itself. Yeah. And that I find deeply troubling. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Good point. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your talk, Joe. I found it very interesting. Thank you. Um, one thing I'd like to concentrate that you mentioned was Trump saying to the people, I am your voice. Mm -hmm. And I want to contrast that with Hillary calling those people deplorables. Mm -hmm. And I also want to think on the Democrat side of Bernie Sanders who I would have voted for if I was an American. <laughs> but to me, that points, why didn't he get the job? And I think most mm. American people saw it not so much, even though they hid behind the religious thing, but as class warfare. Mm. Because to my <laughs> way of seeing it, the middle class and the academic middle class aren't really threatened. You can all have jobs. You can all have health care. Mm -hmm. You can all have a good education. But what happens to the working class in America? As far as I understand, your public system is pretty deplorable. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you're not going to know the advantages of the things that Bernie Sanders talked about. Mm. So do you think that academics should care a little bit less about saying Trump is wrong and looking more at addressing the f real fears and, the, and I believe the genuine fears of a lot of people that once worked in assemblies on mm -hmm. factory floors that don't have work. Yeah, that's Thank a you. good question. Um, with, with some of what he might be proposing, Trump might well be uh, hurting some of those people he wants to be helping here. Um, but I, and I think that there's, um, I, I hear what you're saying. There was a, uh, a 1997 book by Richard Rorty. There was a passage in that book called Achieving Our Country that went viral the day after the election. And in that passage, Rorty said, the the left, the intellectual left in this country, has to be um, uh, careful that its own rhetoric and its own kind of highbrow analysis uh, is really going to turn people off who are struggling. And they are going to turn to a strong man. And, um, and that was, you know, as, as that went viral in the days after the uh, election, um, I think there was some sobering kind of thinking to do. I have some, it's, it's a complicated piece. Uh, let me just do a couple things. One, Bernie Sanders is an independent, he's not a Democrat. He, he, cough, he, he caucuses with the Democrats, so in some sense as a party, I think, I think they had made up their mind, and this came out towards the end of the election. People in the Democratic Party had made up their mind they were going with Hillary. And I think in some ways, you're right, this shows a kind of a, a sense that there wasn't an even playing field. There were institutional resources uh, kind of given uh, to her. Uh, so there were, did, did, did Sanders even get an, an equal footing and an equal voice, um, an equal chance in that primary? Perhaps not. Um, I do think that, that Hillary having been in the, in, the, in the public eye as long as she had, and as well known to voters as she had, still would have carried uh, the day. But the party has some responsibility in acknowledging that uh, perhaps they did not put forward the strongest candidate. But they were all happy as a clam when Donald Trump uh, was, was nominated because they thought he would be easy to win, easy to beat. And, uh, and even in my column about six or seven months before, I said, be careful of what you ask for. This is. This is not. Uh, this is not going to head out or going to shape up very easily. Uh, 
Um, you have described um, in America um, f fear of change, um, racism, things that have certainly mm. occurred in Australia, although we try and deny it. But you've also described a persistent pattern of some leaders um, using theology and manipulating it to their own ends. Mm -hmm. um, is there a uh, which we haven't really seen in our mainstream politi political parties? I mean, is there a way to integrate progressive theology into politics or is it wiser for, or safer for our politicians to engage in you know, social justice issues or issues that are important, practical issues, or is it a good idea, I mean, yeah, yeah. in your view? Yeah. Boy, thank you. Very thoughtful uh, questions. Um, I do think that there is a way, um, let, me, let me put it this way. So one of the cardinal things that the U.S. Constitution has that, say, the Australian doesn't, is the official separation of church and state. Now what that has to do with, with is, 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 is institutions. So public schools funded by tax dollars should not be in the business of, say, of saying to the students, you should be a Christian, right? So it's an institutional kind of separation. However, the discourse of religion and politics kind of naturally overlaps, doesn't it? If I'm running for office and I'm running and I can't possibly meet all the people I'm going to be running against or who, whose vote I want, whose vote I want in the election, then how do I begin to convince them that I'm a good person? How do, I be, how do I begin to convince them that I'm somebody they can trust ethically? One of the things that people do, they'll turn to, is they'll say, well, you know, and increasingly this has become, I think, uh, overdone, is, well, you know, you can trust me because I'm a good Christian. I mean, we live in Oklahoma. This, this happens all the time in our political discourse, and it really should not. But you're asking, can there be, and what I've found, what one finds if you're, if you're looking especially at democratic politics over the last, uh, certainly probably 12 years, 15 years, maybe 16 years, is candidates really trying not to simply play the religion card not to play that card in the way that, for example, George W. really, really did. Uh, or they'll play it in this way. So in 2004, George W. and his big election committee, they had eight states throughout the Midwest. Let's put on those statewide ballots whether we should have gay marriage. And they knew that that would turn out those conservative voters. And sure enough, not only was that voted down in all those states, but George W. won all those states. So there is that tendency to manipulate religion. On the whole, I think Democratic, Democratic candidates at the national level have really tried to deal with that more responsibly, in part because they're trying to appeal to Islamic voters. They're trying to appeal to Jewish voters. They're trying to appeal to the different religious voters and they want to respect everyone. Right? So that sense of respect I think really does um, and that's important. That's a progressive value. A progressive religious value is we respect everyone. And so engaging together for the sake of the common good, that's a progressive religious value. Thank you. Uh, first, just to introduce myself, I'm a Quaker visiting here because uh, I attend choir here on Tuesday nights and the posters around here on, uh, on refugees, on LBBQ, I, and other things have just impressed me. Yeah. And although I didn't like the title of this because I didn't see why a US president should uh, direct what I think about God, when you said at the beginning, doing theology, yeah. that gave it validity. Sure. Um, my point is this, um, the, uh, Trump really brought out the use of racism, hate, um, uh, and the use of nationalism, or, mm. or yeah. uh, brought these up, which is an excuse for privilege. Um, uh, but the, those things, plus gerrymandering, 
really date way back before Trump. Yeah. And yeah. we mm -hmm. talk about, we object to and we voice our objection to the policies, but I don't hear much about objection to the methods to mm -hmm. producing power. You're right. And, and that really is fundamental. We seem to have glossed over those methodologies which have resulted in what we see and those are fundamentally false and fundamentally against human rights. Right. And the conscience of a nation is fragile. And what we're doing with those methods mm -hmm. is destroying the conscience of a nation. We can't legislate love, but to create hate mm -hmm. is fundamentally and deeply wrong. Right. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, in some ways, that's why I gave the talk I did. I, I wanted to expose um, the ways in which um, those layers have been in that discourse. There is no way that Trump would have run, would have won running as a Democrat, would not have done that, even though people were saying, well, he was a Democrat for nine years, blah, blah, but no. This, the series of his rhetorical choices was going after the underbelly of the Republican Party, and you're right. No one wants to, now if this is what you mean by methods, you're right. No one wants to talk about those methods. John McCain may give a thing of, well, we can't have this and this kind of a president. But John McCain is also not talking about the ways in which his own candidacy over the years has participated in elements of that discourse. So this is why I'm, I said it at, at the beginning with respect to the, uh, the novel, it's not clear that Republicans are willing to come clean on this. That's why Jim Comey, I believe, this last week, he said, look, folks, this election's too important. If you want change, vote for a Democrat. Because structurally, the Republican Party is bought in too much into the kind of, of dynamics or methods that you are alluding to. Thanks. Thanks. Um, just a, a kind of two things which are loosely linked. Um, you didn't talk much about um, economic injustice uh, in the US and thinking particularly about the, the extreme concentration of wealth and the way in which that has changed over yes. the last 50 or so years. And yes. I wondered whether if you looked at the US from the point of view of, a, you know, if the, if the US had had a social democratic government and, mm. and, the, and things had been approached more reasonably with less extreme inequity, yes. whether in fact the uh, religious right would have the character that it currently does. Right. And then I'm not sort of a little bit linked to that in my mind, but I'm not quite sure how to articulate it, and it resonates with the Quaker intuition. I, I was thinking about, you know, when I think what's the theological response to this, and if you want, if you like, theology and public discourse, mm -hmm. um, yeah. my intuitions lean towards the, the Quaker sense of the, that there is that of God in each of us. And the, mm -hmm. so the possibility of a political discourse that appeals very directly to, 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 that, to kindness and community. And I wonder if you could say a bit more about the potential of that and how that links in perhaps with the economic injustice stuff. Sure. Um, I do, in, in a number of talks I've, I've given on this, <clears throat> in this kind of circuit of talks, um, the religious and the political as forms of discourse, in my view, are both sacred because they deal with the gathering of a people. And they not only deal with then the gathering of a people, they then also deal with the ongoing issues of how to govern, uh, how do we either maintain or change that sense of identity, how do we engage those who are beyond uh, our borders, our, our neighbors, right? So there's, there is a, a work, as it were, of ongoing uh, constructive theology that's going on politically and in theological communities. Um, what's easy to happen in religious traditions as well as political traditions is that habits get in place, uh, political powers get in place, uh, institutional structures begin to dominate what really ends up happening. And so the way in which people are treated, the way in which others are treated, uh, end up being part of a kind of uh, calculation. Uh, religious bodies are as susceptible to this, it seems to me, as political ones. Uh, so recalling uh, either the, the way in which the divine is present 
and in all of us where there is, which is to say there is an integrity and dignity to all persons, if one doesn't want to use the explicit theological language, um, is to again put on the table um, the basis for some fairly radical thinking, some radical thinking about economics, that again, our political parties in the states seem unwilling um, as much as I in some ways uh, thought that the presidency of Clinton was not, uh, was, was not as bad as it ended up being in terms of some moral, some moral registers. Nonetheless, a real criticism I have of, of Clinton is that in or, several, I mean in order to win, uh, he really did shift the movement of, of the Democratic Party from being with the working people towards being uh, a, a real player in the money game. And, um, and not only that, he also signed legislation that put um, uh, people of color in jail at a far higher rate. And, and then with the street three strikes and your outlaw, uh, where they would then be, if this was their third offense, they would serve the rest of their life in prison. This is kind of a, kind of a horrific way of, uh, of thinking. And so Democrats as well as Republicans have real responsibility for rethinking uh, the basis. As for whether a, a different form of government would have gotten to a better place, what Laura and I have thought about in our conversations with people around the country is like, oh my goodness, even the, the, the way in which you say there's compulsory voting, you, you, you at least have to show up at the voting booth. I mean, that itself is such a wonderful idea. Uh, you've got one, you know, you've got a better, much better healthcare system, and but on a number of political fronts, it seems to us as though Australians still have a sense of making sure the system can work for everybody. Now, there's there's going to be problems, there's going to be gaps, but there's there's a kind of there's at least some thinking about some basic issues of access and fairness. And if in the U.S., if we had had that kind of compulsory uh, voting then that would have taken off the board all the different ways in which Republicans really have tried to limit black registration for voting and voting practices over, over the last 60 years. It would have, and as well as what's going on in terms of, of Hispanics uh, of voting. So, so there are ways in which, yes, you, you, uh, you can, uh, also by looking at your neighbors and some of your allies and friends in terms of what they're doing well, yes, um, I think that... Uh, uh, there's clearly room for major improvement, and I'm uh, still somewhat hopeful for it. But on the on the economic justice issues, it's difficult to get either party's full attention. Right? I think you have some experience of that in this country around some other issues as well. But. Is it me? <laughs> Hi, my name is Brian Nicholson. Um, I lived for most of my life in the land north of Trump. Oh. And, um, but I do have some wonderful relatives who live in Texas who I speak with quite often. Two of those wonderful relatives are Democrats. The other 15 or 16 of them are died in the wood Republicans. Mm -hmm. So the yeah. conversation around the Christmas dinner table is always very interesting. But I wondered this evening, Sarah, if there were any words of hope that you had that you could offer to people like two of my cousins mm -hmm. who are not only overwhelmed by their families kind of not leaving them alone and trying to push them into voting mm -hmm. Republican, mm -hmm. but and for other people who might be in the wilderness in the political situation that is in the, the U.S. at this time. Yeah. Um, there might be some, some real political wisdom around that from others in the room as well, but, uh, so I'm hoping there's some conversations around that. Um, a couple things. I'm the youngest of seven, and uh, I'm perhaps the only Democrat in the group. Uh, and, and so Christmas dinners are also kind of interesting. I did hear a, a story from Brandon Scott, who's a, a wonderful New Testament colleague, and uh, he was reading uh, in the New York Times, I think it was uh, about two months ago, that um, 
uh, there was a report uh, by a, uh, and it's kind of an advertising body, I think, that, that, uh, that does these kinds of poll polls, but that Christmas celebrations across the country were down, were, were like 50 minutes shorter, 5-0 minutes shorter in the U.S. this last year. And they're largely, the, the reason for it, they were saying, was Donald Trump. That, that, that there's such political division that the families are actually leaving one another uh, sooner. Um, is there hope? There's also some polling data uh, right now that shows that even while um, men, for, for some reason, I mean, uh, I think this is across the board, to about a four, 54 to 46 percent are still um, okay with Trump. I, I really don't know how that works, but but the the difference in women's uh, in women voters um, is that the there's about three times more women voting now against, inclined to vote against Trump as in favor of Trump. Uh, and if that would hold, that would be huge. Um, my, my deep concern, just to go the, against the hope, is that Trump may be um, making being racist um, tolerable again. In other words, oh, we're just looking after our own interests here, you know? We're just, uh, we're not racist, no, we're just, you know, looking after our own interests. And that disturbs me profoundly. Um, and so it, it really does go to the kind of the, uh, what this gentleman was, uh, the, our Quaker friend was saying in terms of, of the evil of, of this. Is there hope? Yes. Part of it is that, that voters do wake up. Part of it is that, that we, that we will get some Republicans to say it's time for this person to go, that there's a, a moral change, not simply in the Trump factor, because again, as you know, I think, I think this demonstrates, Trump demonstrates we're with this, and he's, he's actually generating people who want to imitate him now. So, um, so we're stuck with dealing with this. Uh, I'm hopeful, both of a new generation, a millennial generation, I'm hopeful of of folks who are much more willing to see the decency across racial lines, across religious lines, and say, this is bull, this is uh, nonsense. And, and we are going to stand against that. So even in meetings like this and gatherings like this, it's like, yes, there is real hope that there is political will, courage, Paul Tillich called faith, courage to be, and, and by God, that's what we need. We need people who are courageous, on behalf not only of themselves but of their neighbors, and uh, so that's that's I think is the good news. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, thank you very much for a very stimulating talk, and I wholeheartedly agree that um, Trump is not an aberration. Mm, good. But my question or my challenge is this: is at the end you said, and watch out because it could be coming your way, oh, yeah. but. America has also been affected by external and by global forces. It's not just what the history of America is, and, and which you gave very eloquently to explain um, how Trump came to power, and obviously the history of internally to play an important role. But there are forces outside of America, and now within America. America is changing. The demographics are changing. Yeah. The ethnical makeup of the American population is changing. So I wonder whether America or the US also needs to consider more what is happening in the world, and also whether commentators really need to consider how that is influencing what is happening within your population, because it's not just within America, it's also the forces outside America. And I think that that is a very, and, and I have so much admiration for the, the very rich American intellectual life oh and the wonderful journalism that's coming out of America at the mm -hmm. moment, and I recommend the daily podcast to people here from the New York Times. It's a wonderful podcast every night. You can listen to it, sends mm -hmm. me to sleep. Um, <laughs> I mean, not because <laughs> I mean it's so comforting, and it yeah. just really goes into issues and is everything that counters the fake news that comes out of Donald oh. Trump's Twitter feed. Yeah. Um, but I do see that as a challenge to America and to America's intellectual life to really seriously consider the forces outside of America 
as 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 um, influences are shifting, and and I think that that may be an important mm -hmm. thing to consider in going forward. Um, okay. Yes, but thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm I'm not quite sure. Um, if there are some specific influences that you want to name amidst those international or well obviously economic influences and obviously uh -huh. the whole rise of, you think of China, not just china but, but uh, yeah. other areas sure, so there's sure. economic influences yeah. um, and also cultural influences mm -hmm. Intellectual influences. Yes. I, I teach a course, for example, just briefly at Sydney University, and it's on youth digital culture. and And I spent a long time, this last semester, going into this semester, changing the reading list. The reading list was all Ameri from America, and all from American uh -huh. about what's happening in America. When there are huge things happening outside of America, sure. Sure. really leading te technology and re leading ideas in in where technology is taking us. So I think it's just, it's, it, it's economic, it's mm -hmm. intellectual, yes. it's cultural, and it's also within the US. And I think that that is really, of course, the history in the U US and what's happened internally. And I, that was a wonderful argument that yeah. attracts back to 60 years. Oh, yeah. But I also think what's happening in America are, are forces that are, yeah. you know, really buffeting that country and basically America is no longer it, its its status is shifting mm -hmm. I think in the world and I think that that's a really important um, an important uh, area to right. take on board sorry that's very sure. inarticulately no, 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 thank you no I think I think you're right that's it's why uh, it's it was disturbing I don't want you to think I just don't like Republican candidates. I, 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 there are some wonderful Republican candidates. There are some good ones. Um, but um, especially when these, these presidencies can be eight years, uh, you, you want someone who's intelligent. You want someone who's thoughtful. You want someone who's in, engaged, who reads, who is, who is intellectually and morally alive to be a leader. And so, I mean, part of the of the despair is, is precisely because this is a changing time, precisely because there is an urgency in virtually every economic and political wave going back and forth in the way in which we see a real rise of fascism in some ways around the, around the world. And to think that Donald Trump is giving it intellectual cover is just appalling. Uh, but, the, but there are real challenges to be met and that we have someone of such dismal um, intellectual and without without a center uh, that I can see in in the White House is profoundly disturbing. Um, so uh, so so yes. Now there was the I was thinking of the 19th the Immigration Act. I think it was 64 or 65. Diana Eck uh, at Harvard has written on this in terms of the way in which it has brought a whole different set of of immigrants uh, globally to the U.S. And, and yes, so we are even, as she was arguing there, the world's most religiously diverse country by virtue of the Immigration Act of 1964. And uh, so yes, within, and I love that, that decision to do that, again, a Johnson decision, but within that to kind of enrich the resources for democracy, or enrich uh, then the capacity for the U.S. to begin to represent some of the voices from around the world. But you can only do that if there's a sense of a willingness, an openness to engagement. When you've got a, a concerted religious and political movement trying to, trying to say we want conservative Christians to be our ideology, our religious ideology and the flagship of our politics, this basically says all you other people can go home. And in, in a very unethical uh, why? So, so yes, I'm, I'm trying to pick up on your theme of both inside and outside uh, the states, the kind of changes that, that need to be honored, and, as well as the challenges that need to be met. And uh, I think Obama proved himself uh, um, in many ways, not in all ways, but in many ways a very thoughtful uh, leader in the ways that President Trump is showing himself to be just a, a, a real moral disaster.
Joe, thank you so much for um, for what you have led us into that night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, th I think when you finished, we possibly were a little bit depressed. Um, but yeah. <laughs> but you're, I, I want to thank you so much for your engagement with people sure. in the conversation and sure. questions and responses that has led us um, to be more richly resourced to think about our own situation in relation to the US, which, um, as our speaker, uh, one of our questions says, is part of a global system, but it is one that has an enormous impact on us. And I think we watch here in Australia at some things that are just niggling away at us in terms of um, laws that are being changed that seem more fascist, um, that the use of race um, to mm -hmm. divide people um, is becoming more apparently acceptable than it was. So I think as people of faith, you have given us some ways of thinking about that and perhaps given us some motivation and some courage to be mm. public about that. Yes. And I think um, one of the issues that came to mind that we didn't have time to talk about is abortion. Mm. You know, that's, that continues to be, um, and I've read even white evangelical oh. women in particular who say no matter what else Trump does, he's going to put someone in the Supreme Court who will stop stop abortion. We need to have another public conversation about that issue so that ethics can be yes. part of our public oh, yes. life again. Yes. So yes. Um, yeah, there's so many um, important threads that we could pick up, but you all should come back tomorrow um, because we're going to have more time um, to explore this and, and some new themes as well. So uh, tomorrow morning um, we're gathering between 9 and 9.30 for registration and, and gathering. If you haven't registered already and you'd like to, you're very welcome to come. Um, Joe will g give a, another plenary lecture on the rise and fall of the Christian myth, which is looking at the influence of Greek philosophy on Christian tradition. And then we're going to have workshops um, that Jason and Joe will offer um, before and after lunch. And then at the end of the um, afternoon, an opportunity for Joe just to do some reflection on where we've been. So I think this is going to be, an, it's going to be another great day tomorrow um, as part of this uh, common dream. So I do invite you to come back. For those of you who are um, not able to come back tomorrow, it's been good to have you with us. And please stay in touch with us and the other common dreams, things that will be happening at Pitt Street and beyond. So please. Please join me in thanking Joe for a very stimulating evening. Mm.